Hi, everybody, and welcome along to our first GA Museum book club chat of 2023. Um, our first book up is Irish Sporting Lives, and it's edited by Terry Clavin and Turlo O'Reardon. And I'm absolutely delighted that they are joining us today um, to chat about uh, a really interesting book, a bit of a different one for uh, us at the GA Museum. One that's a bit of a conversation starter, one that you can dip in and out of, um, and actually a really nice gift as well for anyone who likes history sport or biography. So getting the ad in at the start. Uh, yes. So th thank you both for uh, joining me um, today um, and for you know allowing us to use the book for the book club. It, um, it's been a, uh, there are GA players and um, I suppose uh, association members in the book, but it's a lot more than that. There's a huge amount of sports. I have a list written out here. Um, of all the sports I think I, I read about while we were going through this. But I suppose we'll start at the beginning and then we'll maybe delve into some of the um, the individual stories. Um, so um, first of all, thank you. And um, I suppose I'll start with you, Turlo. Um, can you give us maybe a brief introduction into the project behind the book, how the book came about um, with the Royal Irish Academy and um, I suppose you know, uh, your plans and how they came to fruition, really. Of course, thank you. And absolutely uh, delighted to be along here today with Terry to talk to you. The 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 volume Irish Sporting Lives is a, is one of the supplementary volumes that we're publishing as in part of the, uh, the wider Dictionary of Irish Biography project, which has been ongoing for about two decades. And it, it contains about uh, nearly 11,000 lives from the earliest a period of Irish history right up to the present day, spanning all sectors and kind of areas. And we were tasked a few years ago with putting together the uh, the Irish Sporting Lives supplementary volume. And it was a real joy. Um, the dictionary takes in the island of Ireland from the earliest times to the present day. And uh, someone who was born in Ireland with a career here, born in Ireland with a career overseas, or perhaps born overseas with a career here. And all three are in the book. Jack Charlton, obviously the latter category, quite a few sporting immigrants, but most people are born in Ireland and, and, and their sporting career is in Ireland. Um, it's a it's a it's a major re ongoing research project based in the Royal Irish Academy, which is um, um, a, a research based uh, organisation um, that some of your members will know of. And, uh, you know, th th there's many more books to follow in different themes uh, in, in this part. And we're, we, we were delighted putting this together. I mean, Terry's going to talk to you about it as well. Uh, yeah, Terry, if you if you want to jump in there. Yeah, I mean, that's what the so that's sort of, sort of explained the DIB and uh, I suppose I should say you need to be dead to get in the DIB as well. Yes. Sir. So uh, that's an important qualification as well. So for GA fans, you know, there's not going to, you know, Henry Shefflin or, um, you know, Cora Staunton aren't going to be appearing in this because, you know, they're they're still they're still very much with us. So the the volume here, uh, yeah, it's 60 lives and we drew them from about 550 sports figures that are in the DIB. So we whittled it wow. down. We whittled it down to 60. And, um, you know, so, OK, we don't have Henry Shefflin or whoever, but we do have uh, from the GA world. We have uh, Kevin Heffernan, we have Christy Ring, and then we have other famous names like George Best, uh, Alex Higgins and Snooker and Vincent Vincent O'Brien. Um, I should say as well, that when we say sports figures, uh, we also include people who don't necessarily engage physically in elite sports. So we uh -huh. have trainers. We have sports promoters, we have sports founders. Michael Cusack would be a, a very good example of that. Though he was, he was a sportsman himself, but you wouldn't say he was an elite sportsman. Yeah. yeah. So he's in because he founded the, the GAA. Um, uh, we made a big effort to include as many women as possible. So which was uh, actually surprising the amount of women and some of the most interesting characters I think yeah, in in the book are very, women. Absolutely. Yeah, indeed, I think about thirty percent are women, which we think is pretty good. You know, because women were actively discouraged from participating yeah. in sport in Ireland for a very long time. And also there was a lack of information really for a long time about women's sports. I mean, no one wrote books about it. No one researched it. Newspapers yeah. didn't report on it. But um, there's been a huge um, flourishing, I suppose, of sports scholarship in Ireland in the last 20 years. And the, our, our understanding of the history of women's sport benefited from that as well. So uh, we actually commissioned five new, completely new DIB entries on women for the purposes of this volume. Wow. So uh, again, it was kind of, I don't think that would have been possible 20 years ago, no. Turlo. I don't think we could have done that. We just wouldn't As have Terry had the says, resources. Yeah. The, the resources w w weren't there and the work wasn't being done. And a lot of these lives are very hard to 
to find out about uh, detailed information. So we rely on the newspapers which have been digitized almost in a revolutionary way, allowing you to search across vast amounts of newspapers to help put together their lives. Um, and also there's this, an uptick in interest. I mean, the Molly Gill entry, in, in, especially as Terry alluded to, is you know really based on amazing material in the GA archives and also some amazing stuff in the uh, Burns Library in Boston College. Um, and, and her life is is really talks speaks to what Terry and yourself just sort of touched on there, which is the barriers to women participating, yeah. what they faced as players, as administrators, and as organizers, you know. And I suppose yep. from your your project initially, if we go back to the start, how how did the idea of a book come about? Was it always going to be a book, or as part of the wider research, do you pull out certain categories at different times and say, okay, we're going to look at sports people now? Or you know, for us that don't really know how research works, how did that come about? Yeah, I think um, it's sorry, something. Terry. Yeah, sorry, it's something we've been thinking about. We've begun doing supplementary volumes about eight or nine years ago. I think we did the. We did one on Easter 1916, so that was a kind of a more tightly focused one on people around Easter 1916. But then you have broader topics that you can do like uh, sport. Um, but this one, it's a very broad topic yeah. and you can really show off the range of the DIB. So that was the main appeal of doing a sports one. Um, there's a huge range of sports uh, yeah. covered in this in this book. Huge. You know, we have. Yeah, I mean, we have all the main sports, you know, GAA, GAA does well. I mean, there's 12 GAA entries. Uh, which is out of 60 is pretty good. And that is, but you know, that reflects the popularity of the GAA. Yeah, and it's, yeah, yeah. I think it's social significance. But, you know, we have soccer, rugby, um, but then we have sort of sports like hockey, um, Archery. handball, uh, with rock climber. You know, we've all sorts of, you know, because of the diaspora, we have a baseball player. We yes. have a, a Aussie rules footballer. You know, so there's quite a there's quite a range of sports and and time periods there. So it's something we've been thinking of doing for 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 a long time as a way of showing off the range of the DIB. And I think lockdown really probably helped us a little bit um, because we had a publishing pause in our normal activities, okay. and it, it kind of gave us time to to focus on this project. And it was you know it was a fairly ambitious project because um, there was a lot to work with and. So we commissioned five new entries. We updated some of the entries as well, because yeah. as Tarla said earlier, the digitization of the newspaper archives has provided us with a lot more material on, on a lot of these sports figures. And if I could just come in there, I mean, what one example there is uh, other overseas archives will have birth, marriage, death, war records that we could find, uh, let alone know that find out they were there, look at on our screens that we couldn't do five, 10, 15 years ago. So um that's been a huge jump and that's Amazing. reflected in many many of the lives um and then some of the sports that have come in they're representative of the roles that women were able to fulfill sporting wise in the late 19th and early 20th century but we left a lot of sports out terry didn't we i mean there was no one from badminton no one from sailing you know other sort of lesser known sports like that but we were we really wanted a handballer and we really wanted a you know a goalkeeper there were certain certain types we wanted to include to represent the changing idea yeah, well, but i think i think it's fair to yeah, say we, two other people could have picked, picked a different 60 yeah you know yes yeah yeah and i was going to ask you that so yourself and your own backgrounds i suppose for your day job you're are you, I, I don't know what your, your titles are research historians so I, uh, <laughs> um and yeah. and yeah um so you know you're good at this you're the right people to do it are you both sports fans as well oh, terry yeah. are you yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I suppose I'm from a rugby family, but I, I'd be more a uh, follower um, of soccer and GAA probably more than anything. Though I played neither to any kind of a to any kind of a level beyond informal kickabouts, really. Like most of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so yourself. Similar, well, similar in that my both my parents were not really sporting, although they were active. But um, I played. I went to many different schools in 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 overseas and in Ireland. So I was played loads of different sports. A little bit, nothing notably, except I was a, quite a swimmer for a while. But uh, lo love rugby and soccer, really, mostly rugby in the last ten years, especially as I've worked on rugby lives from history, um, more recent decades and, and earlier decades. And that's something with, that's quite a joy to look back in this book because the sports are always evolving. I've learned so much about you know, how scrums form and rules changes. And the same in the right. GA lives, you know, Sim Walton's um, form, way of playing hurling and uh, Dick Fitzgerald's uh, Gaelic football career. If you read those two lives, the GA 100 years ago was a very different sport, you know. Oh, the, the games were so different. And, and yeah, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and then with that, so with your own kind of things that you like, you're bringing that to it. So as you said, you know, you're trying to include every sport. Do you find, I would find it hard because I love hurling. Like I could have 60 hurling and camogie players in there. Yeah. Did, did you find that hard? You're trying to leave your bias at the door. 
Oh, yeah, Carlo, was, do you want to, sorry, it, Terry, it was, yeah, you go yeah, first. Yeah, I mean, there. we had a very long process, didn't we? I mean, I think actually if we link it down to 60, and Paul Rouse was helpful in that, actually, he was very helpful yeah. in that as well. And yeah, I think there was some arguments and I think there was pe people we both regret didn't get in, you know, and as I said, it's not, it's not a definitive list. We're not saying these are the 60 greatest sport, sporting yeah. uh, uh, Irish sports people. And there's an, an element of idiosyncrasy to it. And we're kind of going for, I said, we we're trying to show, we wanted to get a bit of diversity and we wanted to ha just have interesting lives. You know, yeah. either interesting because they're they're colourful characters. Or no, it can be interesting because they're great sports people, you know, because they're successful, because they're brilliant what they do. They can be interesting because they're colourful. They can be interesting because it sheds light on, I don't know, the development of a sport at a particular time or on the relationship of society to sport. And sometimes, you know, pol politics in some of them as well. Um, I mean, a lot of the early GA ones are very political. You know, the GA starts off as a pretty political organisation. And yeah. I think the early J entries were Dick Fitzgerald, who's arrested after 1916, uh, Molly Gill, the Camogie player, who's arrested during the Civil War for her republicanism, and um, who has in Sim Walton, who also is uh, has some sort of title in the IRA during the War of Independence. Yes, I'm actually, uh, I, I was looking at the list, I was trying to kind of put through together, yeah. I suppose, the ones. Uh, now I'm interested in all of the people in the book, but just for from a GA point of view, mm. Sim Walton, I hadn't like I'd heard the name, but I, you know I, I was it's mad he's included, say you know, um, but brilliant then, and I can see why you did. So it's uh, how important is a sport to, with social, I suppose, history? Do you think it's you know on a sideline or, or is it core, particularly in Ireland? Turlo, what do you think? It's a really good question. I think if, if we'd have been t t having this discussion 30 years ago, it wouldn't have even been asked as a question, you know, so yeah. I think sports history is rightly beginning to be looked into. The sources are there, the interest is there, the inclination is there. There's a lot of superb younger historians working on this area. The social side, the associational side. What I love about Michael Kuzik is he played rugby, he played cricket and then cricket, he went yeah. to the GA. And, and then he the said, I think is, he hated cricket at the end of his life, even though he exactly, loved it. Yeah, yeah. There's a wider theme here, which is, you know, I, I look at it. Um, there's no real there's no real pattern except many people play many sports. And yes. with the GA players, uh, something Terry pointed out, you know, Moss Keane is a pretty, pretty competent Kerry footballer. He lost the final to Wicklow, but he went on to be a great rugby player. Uh, Jim Stein's a very talented uh, sports person who won, I think, All-Ireland um, with Minor. Martin. Minor, yeah, with the, yeah, minor and he, with Dublin. He, yeah. yeah, he is on. one of the characters I had kind of picked out to talk about because we have, I'm not sure if we still do, but we had his um, one of his jerseys on display here. And he's a huge figure in Australia, Phenomenal. like yeah. any Australian visitors we have are quite emotional stands. about him. Absolutely. Yeah, they I, love him. He, I mean, he got a, he got a state well funeral well. in Australia. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I mean, that's amazing. No, amazing. Yeah. And I don't know if people maybe are that aware, like you'd know of him. But yeah, it's it's a huge and the reaction is often amazing. I think like we could probably do a whole exhibition on, on yeah, Jim Stein. So I was delighted to see him in it. And then just to, just to finish that point, like there's others, Sorry. Kevin O'Flanagan and uh, Johnny Kerry, well-known soccer players, Kerry, especially in the, 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 the kind of middle of the 20th century, both had strong GAA backgrounds, ended up being banned for playing soccer. But the social side of that, we we tend to look back and think of the bands being very strict, but all people wanted to play all sports. Joan O'Reilly was a great hockey player and sprinter, but had also played a lot of camogie. And 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 her life and uh, Molly Gill's life, there's pressures coming in, class, organisational, gender pressures, and also you see in the images what they wore to play in, women especially. Yeah. And um, so I mean, however we define social history, there's a lot of it here. Maybe not directly presented, but uh, as Terry said, it's often the non-sporting life or the background or what what they went on to do and. And, and just personally, what drove it for me partially was I worked on a few people who went off and had these really interesting overseas careers. Tom Horan's cricketer, really major figure in early Australian cricket, unknown in Ireland. There was nothing about him, you know. So mm -hmm. um, and then we tried to get a balance of regions and times and not so much counties, but you're balancing that over like we've two Ulster rugby players, uh, two Munster rugby players, no Leinster rugby player. You know, th that's just the way it goes, you know. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure yeah. there's many people in your book club who would like to see someone from their county or club but it, it, it's not about that we don't ever mean to exclude people to, well we to tried to for, for the GA I think in particular we did try to spread it around a yes. bit like we had yes. four footballers there was one from each province um we felt with the hurling we had you know it was one representative from each of the three superpowers which I think is fair enough for hurling yeah uh, plus Nicky Rackard as well um but the two camogie players are both from Dublin mm -hmm. and I think that's fair because they're such huge figures 
in the history and of promoting. And that team were so dominant as yeah. well, that Dublin I mean, team. And with that in mind, I suppose you've been kind of on the circuit since you you, you launched the book, Do and Talks. I would assume you get a lot of people telling you who you should have put in the book. Does does that come up a lot, Turlough? No, no, actually, you'd be surprised not so much because the, the people who come along would tend to be sort of au fait to a degree or interested in okay. sports and the sports history. But it's actually something that happens in the wider DIB family and organisation. I've met uh, many, many people who feel their grandparents should be in the DIB. And, and that's a very Irish thing. It's very local. It's very regional. It's very, you know, history is very, very, very lived here for the 20th century, especially. But um, I, I don't think, you know, there's there's definitely legitimate discussions about why somebody didn't get in. You know, we couldn't have, and Terry might touch on this, we couldn't have um, two people from the famous 1948 Irish rugby team. You know, we already had Jack Kyle. Couldn't really put in another Des O'Brien or, or, um, or uh, Carl Mullen, the, the, the brilliant Lions captain and Irish captain. So there's a little bit of that going on. And I'm sure Terry will talk about, there's a few hurlers from those teams that uh, Wal- Walton and Rackard and not so much Rackard, but John Doyle, especially, they could have also come in. So there was a little bit of that, but um, yeah, I mean, Terry um, said, sorry. Yeah, no, I was going to say like a few Cork people have queried mm, yeah. by Jack Lynch was in, but I mean, we have, we have Christy Ring in, so, you know, there's only room yeah. for one Cork, you know, and it's, it's pity. I mean, just thinking about Jack Lynch that, I mean, he was, he was, you know, an all time great hurler. And a lot of people forget that his, his yeah. hurling career is kind of overlooked because, um, you know, well, first of all, he has a political career that's highly significant. But secondly, because he's on the same team as as Christy Ring. Um, so things and like he that. Has, does he have a football All Ireland as well? Yeah, I think he was a dual yeah. player. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we have his collection here actually as well. And um, I did. He was one I did think. But I was looking at our Hall of Fame this morning. And um, so at, when we launched the Hall of Fame, they automatically inducted the teams of the Millennium from hurling and football in. And I was just looking at the hurlers, like, and I, I did think that question, like, how do you, who do you pick? Uh, the you know they're all great. So how do you um, how do you pick? Like oh, Nicky Rackard is an obvious one, but there's there's lots of people left out. Yeah. So the geographic thing does make sense, yeah. and the county thing, and you're trying to, and then if I go online, obviously at least are other people there? Then um, what what does that? Uh, you know oh, how yeah, does we, that we, work? Uh, so Julia, yeah, we, we, Julian, we have about I'm, I'm off the top of my head, but I checked this a while ago. I think there's a good 40, 50 hurlers in the DIB. You know there's many more um, Gaelic footballers, uh, many more um, sports people. We also have um, Peggy Hogg, you know, the great the great Camogie goalkeeper in the DIB, which can be accessed at DIB.ie for everyone, yeah. the Dictionary of Irish Biography. So in a way, we're selecting from the wider dictionary and putting a few new names into just a little collection for people, you know? Yeah, so, and, what, um, and what a resource. So it can anybody access that? Yeah, or? it's open access, yeah. DIB.ie yeah. on your phone, tablet or web browser. Um, the hard copy is in nearly every public library. But we've been open access since 2021 and we're delighted with that. You know, it's it's taxpayer funded, a community supported archivists and librarians across the country are always really Amazing. helping us out. Yeah. And just on that, I mean, if we, we, we might turn to images in a little while, but Adam yeah. Staunton and your archivist was in, truly incredible, uh, incredibly helpful in so many ways. And I think there's five or six images that came from him in the book, you know, came from the GAA archive, because some of these people, it's really hard to find a picture of Um you know, it's uh, yeah, and the images really make it. That was one of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, I um, I loved a couple of them. There's a cricketer, or what was his name? Tom that's Horan. Tom yeah, Horan. Tom Horan. Yeah, that's, that's a yeah, great yeah. picture. It's a blizzard. Yeah. It's a blizzard of handlebar mustaches and mutton chops <laughs> and beards and everything. Yeah. yeah, which is a look that still was uh, resplendent yeah. in Australian cricket into the nineties. You know, um, reviews and and, and similars. But it's exactly that. It's looking at what people wore and how they looked. They still play sport. I mean, look at Michael Cusick. He is a bull of a man. He is yeah. a he's seriously fit young man in that in that photograph. Yeah, I know. think I, I like the one of Cusick because a lot of the photos we see of him is of an old man. It's kind of Older, when he's founding yeah. the GAA. And this reminds yeah. you that he was a very keen sportsman. And I think the picture captures a bit of his pugnacity as well, which definitely comes across. Yeah, he's a great character. Life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, I, and Paul Rice's book, The Hurlers, is a great insight into him, which we did before in the book club. But yeah, um, we have his his uh, stick, his blackthorn stick here in the museum and his statue yeah. outside. So <laughs> we're reminded of him every day. But yeah, no, he was a great one to have. In. And he's in a rugby uh, jersey in the photo as well, which is I think. Oh, yeah, I didn't well. notice that. That's great. Oh, yeah, he, he played yeah. for Trinity. And, and yeah. just to say on that, like, Sam Maguire is in the, the wider Dictionary of Irish Biography. A lot of people know the name. They don't know who Sam Maguire was. He's a person. person you know? yeah. And if yeah. we were doing 150 lives, we might put Sam in. But we, we had to we had to whittle it down. But the images was a real joy. It's very touched on. It was a sort of a lockdown project that suited us. And 
we trolled deep far and wide and a couple of people it was a real real joy to get an image because there wasn't one available or wasn't one known of them we tracked them down through family members or obscure archives you know um that was that was yeah and that i think they us. really they really lend and is that everyone has an image there, there's there's yeah. none yeah. you couldn't find which is amazing there was another I mean, I'll, one I'll, actually I'll, I'll tell a very brief story about terry mullen yeah in paralympian Nobody in the Irish yeah. Olympic movement, the British Olympic movement, the Paralympic movement, the International Olympic or Paralympic movement had an image of her. The only one was wow. a photograph of her head from behind. Which is amazing you know, because she isn't, you know, it's, a more, it's a more recent story. Yeah, absolutely. Eventually, and, you know, Terry's heard the story a few times. Eventually, I tracked down an interview that mentioned her wife's married name. Oh, sorry, her sister's married name. So through that, I could work out her husband's name. I found a death notice. I, I found a likely person. Uh, and it went through old phone books and found a few people and rang for months and months. And eventually someone picked up the phone and it was Terry's sister. And she just had her mobile phone stolen that day, just out of hospital. But she get, she rounded up an image from her nieces and we got an image of her, which is with her medal on the podium in Seoul. And yeah, it's, it's a story a because one. I think it's almost it's almost emblematic of the marginalization of, of, of disabled sports people and Paralympians as it, they're now known. And, it, you know, it really yeah, it was lovely to, to have, have her there, you know. Yeah, a lovely one. And um, oh, let me see now. I have about a million. My notes are all over the place here. Um, what? Uh, who are your? Uh, probably everyone asks you this, but I'll ask you both. Who is your favorite character in the book? Turlo, you can go first. <laughs> okay, I, I'll find this one hard, and I'll try to show up soon. I'm going to mention three names and focus on one. I suppose as a rugby fan, I've always been interested in the history. And when I worked on Henry Dunlop for the dictionary, I wrote a lot more about him. And he, there's only a, an excerpt of his life here. But he, he worked with Kuzik and, and they, they would have known each other, which I find fascinating, to found what was Lansdowne Sports Club, became Lansdowne Road, the home of soccer and rugby. Um, I've always been a fan of what I heard about Jack Lynch or uh, sorry, Jackie Kyle, people who'd seen him or knew him. My, my cousin lived in Zambia and knew him vaguely a very modest man who went overseas to avoid his rugby fame uh, by all accounts. And, but, but if I was to pick one, it's probably Ken Goodall and I won't go on too long, but just a phenomenal rugby player. I'd never heard of until I wrote about him for the DIB, the dictionary. And he converted to rugby league. He came from a working class background. Um, he was, he was the first ever Irish player to be world player of the year. He was a barnstorming, try scoring, you know, modern archetype uh, back row forward. And uh, I, I, I urge all your uh, viewers and readers to maybe have a look at Ken, Ken's life. But yeah, he'd be my, he'd be my, the, my favourite. I go a bit. Oh, great. And he's actually not one. I, I've read them all, but I might decide. I don't, he, I'll go back and have another look at him. Thank you. And Terry, what about you? Um, one of my favourites would probably be Molly Gill, the camogie player. Yeah. Um, I, I quite enjoyed her life. It was fascinating. And you get, you know, I suppose her involvement in camogie was an extension of her deep engagement in kind of Irish cultural nationalist activities. She was a printer with Kula Press with the Eight Sisters, and she was uh, heavily involved in Common Amon during the War of Independence. As I said, as I said, as I said earlier, she gets arrested uh, during the Civil War, but she's in the first generation. She's kind of the outstanding player, really. She seems to be, judging by the match reports that we could read, that we could get hold of, she just seems to be head and shoulders above every other Komogi player of the first generation of Komogi players. And so she's able to play on into her 40s when the first All-Ireland Komogi Championship is held. Uh, so she captains Dublin, the, two, the first two All-Ireland Komogi Championships. Uh, but she's also extremely important, you know, not just for being an outstanding Komogi player, but also because um, she's president of the kind of newly fledged Komogi Association for its first 20 mm -hmm. years or so. And uh, that's a fascinating story, which again, I had no idea about. And Will Murphy did a great job in, in, in uncovering this research in the GA archives. And I, I do think that this is, this is sort of like a fruitful area of further research by, by, by scholars, the early history of the Camogie Association, because, you know, it's bound up with her Molly Gill's attempts to preserve the independence of the Camogie Association from the GAA. And she was quite feminist in her views. Uh, she was very outspoken about how women should need to play sport. They should have their own sporting organisations, I think, as well. She she didn't want us coming under a kind of the male dominated GAA. But sort but sort of politics proves her undoing, I think, in the end that mm -hmm. the, um, there's a big dispute over whether the GAA ban should be extended to the Camogie Association. And the she's from Dublin. And in Dublin, a lot of the Camogie players also play hockey. So yeah. there's huge resistance to this in Dublin, and but there's also resentment, I think, in some of the rural counties. They're seen as this Dublin clique, and it all ends in acrimony, and she's eventually ousted. But it's just it's it's just a fascinating story, and the Camogie Association kind of suffers then as a result of the yeah. the kind of the, the the problems with this. 
But um, it's just it's an example, I suppose, of how politics can intrude in on sport, but also how sports, I suppose, generates its own. Your sporting organisations are well capable of generating their their own politics too. But um, like generally in a DIB entry, we try we try to sum up the existing scholarship. You know, we try to sort of look at the most recently accessible sources. But this is an example yeah. of a DIB entry that I think adds something new on top of that as well. So I think it's I think yeah. it's great. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. And I, I, as you say, it's maybe now with with everything being available for research, we might mm. learn more about more women in, in yeah. sports. Yeah, and, and in it's fact, brilliant. The, Molly, the Molly Gill one, the, the photograph is great as well because it gives you an idea of how restrictive some of the clothing yes. women's sports and we, we have actually a replica of that camogie uniform down here in the yeah. museum and the amount of like children you know like mm. are like what how, how, how could they avoid yeah. that it is I've crazy showed it to my, yeah. my nieces you know big big works yeah. for the camogie players they're just, just aghast of it and I think it speaks to it's also uh, that's a wider theme in the, the women's sports people in the in the in the volume the hockey player you know the the the, the constant male gaze if you will and, and the, 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 the supposed purience of women engaging in sport and that's a factor Right up until the more recent decades, um, and the, you know, as Terry Hollow, I think Gail is it's an amazing life, and I know I know there's good more work being done on her because there's more to, more to find out, you know. Brilliant, and, yeah. Brilliant but story. also, what what Molly Gill is wearing is nothing compared to what some of the 19th century sports yes. women have to wear, like the tennis players have to wear, you know, ludicrously Golfers. extravagant outfits, yeah. you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's a great. The other photo actually looking at clothes is there's an archer. Uh, what's her name? Beatrice Hill. Uh, oh. Yes, that's a great yeah. photo as well. Yeah. I love yeah. that and photo. Like, yeah. You know, she she's the first Irish uh, person to win a medal at the Olympics, but it's it was one of the very few sports that were open to women and intrinsically open to to gentry or you know uh, aristocratic women. But uh, yeah, when you see someone doing that on the corset, but as Terry said, look at Mabel Cahill, the tennis player. She played in that and more. And um, uh, what's uh, May Heslet the golfer? Uh, you know, yes. playing golf in a long skirt. Um, Lizzie LeBlanc the climber, climbing in skirts and having two different skirts, one to be seen in. That's a great. Climb. That's a that's obviously was a hard to source photo actually as well. It's good. Actually, surprisingly confusing. easy because she, she had published a lot of books and and she was became a oh, really yeah. a really fine photographer and actually one of the first women filmmakers. So there was a record in her many published books. The oh, okay. she had three married names and th thus four names. So her career tends to get muddled a little bit and. Um, Carol Osborne, who wrote the entry for us, a brilliant scholar of British sports history and Alpine history, women in Alpine history, in particular, did a great job there. But yeah, you would have, you would have, some some of them you would have thought there was an image, like Terry Mullen. And yeah. others, you would have thought there wasn't one, you know. Um, yeah. And it, just just to touch on something that, you know, um, something that became apparent to me when I looked at Rackard and and uh, John Doyle, the great Tipperary hurler, finding out who the, who was in the image. Terry rightly queried if John Doyle was John Doyle, and we got on to mm -hmm. Adam, Adam Stone and said, no, we think it's him. Uh, but we weren't sure. And, you you know, you're looking at an image. So I eventually managed to track down John Doyle's son through a friend of a friend, spoke to him on the phone, sent him the image. He said, that's my dad. But he said he wouldn't believe the amount of books and pamphlets and photographs he's seen that list that's that the wrong image. John Doyle and it's not his dad. You wow. know, so even verifying the images was really interesting. And another thing that stood out for me from their story, they played against each other. In both entries, when you when I read them a few times, I noticed there's a mention of Art Foley, the goalkeeper. Sorry, Christy Ring and John Doyle. There's many people who show up in these lives who don't get their own entry or haven't got their own entry in the DIB yet. And goalkeepers tend to be kind of ignored. So we squeezed mm -hmm. one goalkeeper in the, the soccer player. Um, uh, Alicia Scott. Alicia Scott. But, yeah. you know, I often feel for Art Foley here because, you know, he was a great goalkeeper on a great team. But it was ring gets remembered. Doyle's on the other side of a rock guards they're playing, you know, and it's, it's, it's yeah, a Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, forward, the forwards tend to hog all the glory. But yeah, we tried to this day. defensive players. I think one, so we four... Gaelic football I think one is a defender and same with her we've one defender so we try to you know but I guess people are more interested in the free they scoring they just remember there's tackles. probably more yeah. footage yeah. more photos yeah yeah, oh, yeah it's, exactly. the, it's the nature but maybe some players like to go under the radar a little bit too um, I wanted to touch on Paul Rice's introductory essay as well which I really enjoyed um, I actually kind of read it halfway through reading the book because I didn't read it all in I suppose chronological order um, he took uh, I suppose he talks about a few things one the sport being a shared experience uh, but then how that experience can be experienced differently but personally as well I suppose he also talks about sport um 
um, and how amateurism, I suppose, helps it be more maybe socially diverse in Ireland, because you can see that throughout the book. You know, you touched on it a bit, Charlo, about class and, you know, how would maybe a working class person become a, an Olympian or an archer or, you know, um, so maybe the GAA had a hand in, you know, making sport more accessible. Now, I don't know. I'm speculating. Um, and then he also touched on what we talked about, the, the, the variety and the nature of the sports included. So um, a few thoughts on that, maybe. Terry, particularly the piece, I suppose, of, on, on the socially diverse nature of, of sport. Yeah, I mean, when, when we start off, if you look at the earliest lives, I'm just trying to think, it, it, there's a lot of elitist sports and it's mm. particularly marked actually with the women's sports figures that it's, it's yeah. women are encouraged to play kind of genteel sports and they're sports that, you know, they're not accessible to, to normal people. And I suppose particularly J uh, Cusack is a, a crucial figure in, in seeking to, to widen sport i think there's a quote from the entry on cusack where he said he wants to make make sport open to every to every irishman um although you know there's a gendered formulation there but you know it's still an improvement mm. on what we saw you know and yeah i think paul deals with that in his essay where he talks about how sports got had the patronage of the british establishment as well because mm. you know these sports were seen as part of the modernization of, of bringing ireland into this into this modern multinational empire, really. And I suppose the GAA is a bit of a, I, I suppose, a pretty uh, inevitable reaction to that in a way. You know, it's an assertion yeah. of Irish distinctiveness and uh, but also of a greater degree of of social inclusivity as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a big class thing that it's also a sense that certain sports are OK for certain classes. So soccer is very working class. If you look at all our soccer lives, I think they're all they're pretty much all practically working class. Maybe not Kevin O'Flanagan, Turlow. He, he could be middle class, maybe, you know. Yeah, I think him and um, Jackie Carey are sort of, they're they're just, you know, they both went to good CBS schools and played soccer and, and did well in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are the exception to prove the rule. I think Joan O'Reilly is interesting. She's a butcher from Crumlin, but goes to yeah, the school. Yeah, butchers, I saw that, yeah. One of, the, one of the few Catholic girls at school who were being educated by others who play, play um, hockey, but she played a lot of camogie, won, won medals in camogie in Dublin, but the, that kind of barrier that, that Gil faced. But class is all over the place. And, and as Terry touched on, the 19th century women sports people, the only outlet for them, there's no there's no education, there's no careers, is actually sport. And it's archery, perhaps croquet. We have the croquet player Nina Coote. And that changes over time. So it tracks, it tracks over time. And then we are all the way up to Anne O'Brien, the brilliant intercore born um, soccer player who emigrates to be a leading figure in European football. You know, and, and, and that that's charting the evolution. But yeah, as Terry touches on it. John Fortune Lawrence is in the book. I, I, I'm probably more of his fan, but he he was a um, um, a shopkeeper who sold the paraphernalia to the, the early sports that were emerging in this imperial context right. in the, the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and, and works with Dunlop. And I often imagine did Lawrence know Cusick and Cusick knew Dunlop, and these people all maybe you know talked or didn't talk and fell out well, or didn't fall out. Yeah, in sports, you know. Mm. But class is not everything, and you have people from humble backgrounds being able to make yeah. their way in. Dave Gallagher, the rugby player, was from a humble background. I think that reflected rugby in New Zealand, I think, was more egalitarian anyway than it was in uh, Ireland and England. Same um, horn and cricket, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you then have Beauchamp Day, who's from a very posh background, but he becomes a professional runner, which is considered highly disreputable. So that's the thing with, with biography. There's just a randomness to biography as well, you know. And, yeah, and, you it's know, amazing. The, you see the general themes, but there's always a scope for an individual life to kind of be pretty unique and you can just enjoy it in its isolation as well, you know. Yeah, uh, the, one, the one one I've enjoyed the most is actually Paddy Perry. I mean, I, I didn't quite know what handball was, having grown up mostly overseas. And even the other day I was walking past Green Street, Green Street Courthouse in Dublin and there's a what I think is a handball court or a handball alley abutting the courthouse. I'm, I'm guessing hardly anyone uses it anymore. I could be wrong, but it's probably been um, kept for security reasons. But you see them and people ask, what are they? You know, and it's... Yeah, they're yeah. amazing. We actually had a girl in from, I think, the US during the week and she is studying handball alleys oh, randomly. Great. So, yeah, yeah. And I think there's um there's a social media account dedicated just to photos of handball alleys. So, wow. uh, yeah, because <laughs> we, we obviously, handball is one of the sports within the GAA as well. So, <laughs> and a lot of hurlers would have been good handballers and, uh, you know, and a lot of GAA clubs would have had handball alleys. But I, I think, yeah, sadly, a lot of them maybe are gone. But there's certain parts of the country. I think Carlo's is pretty strong. And, really? You know, there's really? cer like certain I, parts of the country, yeah. 
all these West Wicklow Carlow villages will have nothing maybe but a handball handball alley, not a guy club that's in the amazing. town or anything. But it is amazing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's a really interesting research project that you're, you're, Isn't you're talking it? about. Yeah, you yeah. get mm. mad queries coming in. It's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was delighted to see the handballer in there. Um, and I just, I suppose, a couple of things that were going a little long, but it's very interesting. Um, we might actually do it again because it's great. But um, there was one character I did want to talk about because I had never heard of her, Clara Ma Copley. Um, is it Copley or Copley? Uh, um, I'd say Copley, uh, but uh, Terry Terry found her and it was fascinating. We we I got in contact with various boxing organisations to try and find out if the legend's true, and then I got an email out of this blue by this fantastic boxing historian, amazing man called Miles Templeton, who said yes, it is, and he had all the records and her application to become a a boxing um, promoter. Which t- for your listeners and readers, she's the first female or woman promoter in Britain or Ireland of boxing, which is just so unusual you can't imagine it in Belfast in the 1930s and through the newspaper archives with a relatively unusual surname you could trace back her origins in the fairground in the north of England and then her career in in, um, in Belfast and when we were up in Belfast for the sports history conference I went down to Donegal Pass where she lived and it's a blue pa- plaque up there that would has her date of birth wrong I think and that's one of the things we work we spend a lot of time on is yeah. you know and, and, and Gallagher lied about his age to get into the army early so it was age of death was had to be researched but copy is phenomenal i mean it, when you think about she was she was uh behind a, a real outgrowth of of um what they call boxing booths where rinty mana and others the great ulster boxers of the mid 20th century came out of her her stable if you will and you know it's it's fit for a biopic you know i was just going to say it should definitely be a movie uh yeah it's it's unreal so i get on that now and, and get the get the script written <laughs> yeah yeah, that was brilliant. And my last question, uh, it's kind of more a personal one. How, there's two of you, how does that work? Like, as a partnership, it's a difficult thing, I'd say, to co-author. You know, mo- this is the, f- I've done a couple of children's books where you maybe have people, but it's the first book club one where we've had joint editors, I suppose. Um, is it is it an easy thing? Have you both brought different skills? Um, you know, you obviously be nice about each other now when you're answering this. <laughs> Terry, you go first. Well, we've been working together for a long time now, so we've been kind of putting up. We're kind of used to each other at this stage, so that definitely that definitely helped. helped. And uh, it was during lockdown as well, so it was a great project. It was a great outlet for us at a time when I think yeah. everyone was going was going a bit stir crazy, you know, during the the very start of lockdown. So I, I think it went actually, I mean, we did have a few rows about who was going to get in, who wasn't going to get in. And, you know, I think we had our favourite sports and our favourite characters yeah. as well. Yeah. But uh, I think it was all managed, you know, we knew when to leave it go and come back and let the dust settle. And, you know, camera, wiser and councils it, prevailed, you know, so uh, th- there was no, I, I, you know, of course I would say this, but there was no major bust ups anyway, I don't, I, I don't think. And we had different... We had different characters that we were interested in, so we could do a kind of division of labour, you know. Um, yes, that's what I was going to ask. Did you kind of divide up the characters? Did you like literally do it that way? Yeah, it was generally Turlo, pretty yeah. easy. I, yeah, I think Turlo. What do you think of the division? Yeah, I, I, I honestly try and um, with what Terry said, we know each other very well. We probably would have debated sports more than anything socially at work. Um, yeah, so this is getting paid to do that. It's great. Yeah, we were tasked <laughs> with this way back, and then things came along and got put aside. So it was perfect for lockdown. For for many months, I spoke to Terry more than anyone apart from my family. You know, we'd be checking <laughs> in, we checked this, we emailed them, and chasing, and mm. you know, and and we definitely divided and conquered in certain areas and realm. But then I know that Terry would come and look at stuff that I'd worked on and he'd spot stuff and vice versa. Because it always takes that outside eye to say, well, have we got that right? Or is that the right way of doing it? And if we describe that right, I would say hand on heart, I don't think I changed the selection. I'm pretty happy with it now, Terry, six months out. You know, like there's, I wouldn't change it too much. Um, I would don't think no. I changed it at all. There was, um, there was the long jumper. There was one long jumper who was very good. He yeah. set a world record for 20 years. I think he deserved to get wow. in, but that was, yeah, Peter O'Connor was. Peter O'Connor, uh, to, yeah, exactly. Set a world record think, in 1901, I think, and stood for 20 years. So I thought that was, that's a pretty great achievement. But yeah. we had a lot of athletes, had a lot of athletes from around that time. There was a lot of successful Irish athletes at the start of the 20th century. Yeah, the Davins were another one. Yeah. I, they're not mm-hmm. in the book. Maurice Davin, yeah. I, he was yeah. one maybe that could have gone in. We have a great letter here in the museum from an athlete that was writing to Maurice Davin asking him was he mm-hmm. going to take part in the competition because if wow. he was, if Maurice was going, your man wasn't going to bother travelling. He was, wow. you know, he was such was his kind of notoriety. So he's, a, he's another one. But as you say, athletics, Irish people have, I suppose, always maybe excelled at athletics um, uh, I mean, no, it's really particularly 
Peter O'Connor's entry for the DFB, I think, is written by his grandson, who, who wrote a brilliant full-scale book wow. about his dad, or his granddad. I think it was 1920, Terry, in LA, and it's a really interesting story. The TG4 made a great documentary about it, and there's probably a good 10, 15 names we would have squeezed in if we could have. The size of the book, the size of the manuscript, the size of the yeah. project, time. You have to make your call at a certain point. Um, but yeah, no, it was, I, I would have liked to have had I it. I learned a lot working from Terry, and like... You know, I think I think we all learned a lot about images. We learned a lot about putting together. Yeah. We've been doing this, but in a slightly different way, in, in, in yeah. a bigger construct. And um, yeah, it kept kept me sane during during the lockdowns as well. Oh, it's a honest. fantastic lockdown project. Yeah, for sure. I would um, like well, to have any... a dual player, a dual GAA player in or something mm. like mm. that, but we couldn't, we just couldn't squeeze one in. You know, dual players mm. were a big feature of the GAA up until relatively Huge, recently. Particularly so, in Cork, but, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that would have been yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah, my, yeah, my first yeah. exposure to GA is, is when Cork did the double. I was in West Cork that summer with family and I always remember this amazing thing. The, oh, the wow. counties not do the double very often. I think it's 88. But um, yeah, and, and, and I think the range, the deeper range, we know we have we have jockeys, trainers, huntsmen. Um, it's, it's trying to speak to sport, sport in the wider sense. We could have maybe had a chess player, a poker player. Yeah. There's, 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 there's a lot of interesting lies in, in the wider DIB, the Dictionary of I mean, Geography. I mean, fans of equestrianism of horse sports would say we, I, mean, I think we have five or six equestrian entries, but you could argue that, you know, equestrianism has been a huge thing in Irish history as well. Mm -hmm. and that, you know, so the people, everyone has legitimate grounds. Of for course they do. Things, and you're biased you know? to, your, yeah. to your own sport, but maybe that's yeah. the beauty yeah. of the book. And you then, know? And, and you're and you're opening like, yourself up. Some people might say, why have we got a cricketer? Well, cricket does seem to be the most widely played sport in the 1860s around that. But then we have four boxers. Is that enough? Is it too few? I mean, half mm. of all Irish medals won at the Olympics are by boxers. You know, it's a it's, it's a huge sport. And I think Terry is much stronger than that area. But the, the, the Dan Donnelly on right up to Doyle and McTeague, that's the history of boxing in Ireland and overseas. Yeah. You know, the, 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 yeah. And a great characters in boxing. We had exactly. loads. We had loads of colourful boxers. We could have included yeah. about 20 very colourful boxers. And we just, yeah. we just, you know, we just had to come put them all in. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's know. lovely to hear you, how you've been reading it. Um, you know, like a lot of people say, oh, I dip into it. And that's kind of, we, it, not quite deliberately, but that's that's what it's designed for in a way. You know, like, oh, I'll read about that person and that person and yeah. go left to it's right. Not it's not what I expected, I have to say. I, I think I came to going, I'm going to know all of these people already. And then I, I say I knew properly maybe 10 of them. So it was amazing. Uh, no, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I think for now we might stop it there because um, we could yeah. literally talk about this all day. It's brilliant. But we might come back to it um, maybe even in the museum if you'd be interested at some stage because it's That's a great. fascinating book. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really appreciate you taking time out. I'm sorry for going over a little. Um, no, but no, thank you pleasure. so much. And Thank thanks you. to everyone for listening. And we will be sending you out details of our new book club for next month very soon as well. Thank you.